Hey guys, I'm back again. Uh, the title and topic of this video is called The Lord's Table. And um, I remember doing uh, communion in the past, you know, with a group of people, you know, when I was younger, it was in my 20s that um, I had a small group that we got together and we were following, we were following like the book of Acts, you know, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, when the early disciples broke bread together, prayed together, and gave to those in need. And we also had communion, communion together. And, you know, it was such an awesome time. And, you know, as you go to church, you tend to see <coughs> people take communion. But it's... It's what you read after, I believe, in 1 Corinthians 11 about the Lord's Supper and how we need to examine ourselves before we take the Lord's bread and the, the, the wine or grape juice, whatever you have, um, that symbolizes his body and his blood. And, you know, I'll get into that eventually, but it seems like a lot of people tend to use it as a religious act. Okay, I'll just take communion and go on with their lives. And, you know, how many are sick because they don't revere the act in itself? Um, you know, there's people with unforgiving hearts. There's people that refuse to work things out. And so they take the Lord's table and, you know, it says it even in Scripture. So... You know, to me, it's more than a religious act, and I pray that in this video, you could see that as yourself. You know, see that for yourself. Um, you know, when Jesus spoke about, uh, this is my new covenant, that, you know, I'll get into all that, but it's, it's more than a religious act, and I pray that um, this will help open your eyes somewhat, that it's more than just an act. It's, it's a replacing of an old covenant and how Jesus has set us free with his body. So, like I had said in many other videos, I don't pretend to be an expert in it. I don't pretend to be this great theologian. But I'm just somebody that, you know, I, I love God. And any re revelations I give, you know, I don't want to hoard to myself and, you know, become prideful in that. You know, it's not about that. It's about sharing our talents with other people so that they can benefit and that they can grow. So there's so much to learn regarding the covenants, the old covenant, the new covenant, you know, and everything that, you know, people had to deal with under the old covenant and how free we are under the new. So under the old cover, uh, old, under the old covenant, because of sin, bull, sheep, and other animals were required to deal with that sin. You know, Moses gave, or God gave instructions through Moses, and how to prepare these sacrifices in order for sin to be dealt with, and there, there it was very specific. So, um. We need to remember that the sin in itself, God, it still needed to be dealt with. And, you know, people were still, they still felt guilty because of their sin. Because it wasn't fully dealt with. I mean, God used scapegoats, you know, priests put his hand on the goat and the, the God would, would transfer the sin over to the goat and then, or whatever animal, you know, God sent some into the desert for them to die. You know, after sin was transferred over to the animal, then they would be sacrificed. God dealt with the sin, you know, and, you know, that's a revelation in itself that once the sin was transferred over to the animal, God destroyed the animal in order for that sin to be dealt with. But, um... In scripture, it said that men still felt guilty for their sin. So, it didn't remove it according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. People had reminders of it, the guilt. You know, 
One second, let me read it. So I already had mentioned Hebrews 10.4, so allow me go, to go um, to and read verses 1 through 4. It says, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, verse 2, would they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins? But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So, we have it listed there in Scripture, you know, and so... As it read further, you know, it's a clue of what the Holy Spirit would eventually do, which he would take the, the guilt away. So, there is eventually then a promise of a new covenant. And it, I have listed Hebrews 8, 8 to 13. One second, let me pull it up. So, in Hebrews 8, 8 to 13, for Speaking of the, the first covenant, for finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, says the Lord. Now, when he says covenant, there's a new one that's being instituted, which makes the old one obsolete. Uh, for this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. For they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen, and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. So, we have exactly what it's stated in that covenant, where apparently there's no laws that are being given, there's no laws that are being followed. But God says that I will write my law on their hearts, and I will be their God, which shows a relationship, a, a change. Before they... You know, he wouldn't be their God because men followed their sin. And there wasn't a relationship established between us and the Father, between us and the Son and, and the Holy Spirit until Jesus came. So, like I said, there was a promise of a new covenant in that, in which uh, made the old one obsolete. Um, now, a, a covenant can only be active when there is a death of someone. It's like a will, which I'll eventually get into. Now, the new covenant, which was stated, uh, what I just read, um, it, like I said, it made the old one obsolete. The way of life for us had been told beforehand. We no longer needed animals for sin to be dealt with. Uh, with Jesus entered by his blood, under this new covenant. And that's in Hebrews 9, 23 to 28. Let me read that. Okay, according to Hebrews 9, 23 to 28. Therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in heavens, <clears throat> in the heavens to be cleansed with these things, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now, it, it's kind of interesting that after Jesus rose from the dead, he said, I must ascend to my Father, which he, he said to Mary Magdalene, I, I must ascend to my Father, to my God and to your God. So maybe it was possible at that time, and what happened is that Jesus ascended to the... Um, the holy place in heaven offered his blood in order for our redemption to be complete. Just a thought. 
Now, like I said, I'm not pretending to be this great theologian that knows everything, but just different revelations I give, you know, I just wanted to share. So, in verse 25, nor was it that he would have offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place, year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer once, to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it was appointed for men to die once, and after that comes the judgment. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for the salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. So we can see exactly what Jesus had done with his own blood and how it was different from the Old Testament. Um, we no longer have reminders of sin because the blood of Jesus wipes the slate clean. As it says in Hebrews 10, verses 16 to 18, <coughs> it says, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. In their sins and their laws, lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. And, you know, that, speaking of verse 18, now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. And when you read further, um, there is, there is that verse, and this is sort of like a side note that I want to speak of, where a lot of people have fear where it states, uh, for if we go on sinning, sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Now, a lot of people tend to use that, stating, okay, if somebody makes a mistake in sin, then they're trampling on the blood of Christ. As it says, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the two, testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled under the Son of God and has underfoot the Son of God and ever, has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and insulted the Spirit of grace? Now, like I said, people tend to use that verse and say, oh, okay, if somebody sins then they're trampling on the Son of God and they have a fearful expectation. That's not speaking of that. It's speaking of what Jesus had done on the cross. And if you look back on verse 16 to 18, speaking of the sacrifice um, where Jesus said, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind I will write them. And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now when there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Now, that's exactly what it's referring to. When you go, he was speaking of it further, that when people tried to become, or you know, follow the Old Testament, you know, the laws and all that, then you are trampling on the Son of God. In his sacrifice. That's what it's speaking of. Not when somebody makes a mistake with sin. So, you know, just to prove it further. One second. Now, as you read it, um, verse 30 of chapter 10. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will pay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But remember the former days, and this is what he's... Uh, the the author of Hebrews is saying, you know, we're, we're he's speaking of, you know, how people follow Jesus. But remember the former days when, after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were treated. 
For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For in a little while he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. Now why would somebody who is um, making a mistake in the sin, what does that verse have to do with, you know, making a mistake in sin? You know, somebody goof up or whatever, and they, they're they fearing judgment and all that. It's not speaking of that. And it proves it here. For yet in a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. So it's speaking of the sacrifice of Jesus. You know, if you fall back and want to become righteous on your own, and following the old covenant that Jesus already fulfilled through his body and his blood, then if you're, you shrink back into doing the old covenant, then you're trampling on the Son of God and his sacrifice and considering it nothing. So that's what he's speaking about. The The author is encouraging them in their faith and to remember how they used to be when they walked with Jesus. And it says here, but my righteous one shall live by faith. Live by faith in what Jesus had done by his redemption for us, by his sacrifice for us. So, you know, I just want to say that as a side note. <clears throat> so, um, we no longer have reminders of sin because the blood of Jesus wipes the slate clean. And I believe I had already read that. Uh, 16 to 18. Now, where there is the forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering of sin. So, the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> through Christ, cleanses us. Um, now, <clears throat> excuse me, at the Last Supper, Jesus fulfilled the scripture in Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. <clears throat> um, Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the, the scroll of the book, it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Uh, let me make sure that, okay. So when he said, Jesus fulfilled that scripture itself when he came into the world um, through his sacrifice. Um, then he set a new covenant, new covenant I made when he gave them the bread and gave them the, the, the drink. No longer did we have to deal with keeping the law, laws of the old covenant. Jesus fulfilled it by his body and his spirit, our conscience. So, through his sacrifice, with his spirit, you know... There is a, a relationship then established. When he sacrificed himself, himself as a whole spirit and body, he dealt with our sin every way possible. You know, um, to, and since he did that, he then dealt with our consciences to where we no longer feel guilty. We go to God, we confess our sins according to 1 John 1.9. Lord, forgive me for my sins, such and such. He cleanses us, and we have that promise in Scripture. So, through his body that was dealt with, you know, at that one time, sin was dealt with, at his sacrifice, past, present, present, and future, all at once, he dealt with our sin, to where he'd taken care of everything. Um, so, he took care of our conscience. The work of God without law keeping, and it's in John... John 6, 28 to 29. Let me pull it up. 
All right, Jesus um, says, Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may do the works of God? And that's when Jesus multiplied bread for the people, and the, that's what they expected. Their eyes were on uh, what Jesus had done, and they, they expected to receive more food. But he was telling them, You need to look higher. You need to look at the one who's given you bread, you know, and everything. So he said, therefore, they said to him, <clears throat> what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you may believe in him whom he has sent. And he's speaking of the father. Um, Jesus is the bread of life. And that's in John 6, 43 to 58. And when we eat of this bread, we live forever. Um, so 6.43, Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it of it and not die. I am the, the living bread that comes down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So he said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the son, if unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food. And my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread which come down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. So Jesus said that there, that he is the bread in which if we partake we live forever now the actual creating and remembrance of the covenant is in Matthew 26 one second alright it's chapter 26 verses 26 to 29 while they were eating Jesus took some of bread and after a blessing he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said take eat this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness, for many, for the, given, for, for the forgiveness of sins. And so, and then he says, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So the old covenant became invalid when Jesus mentioned the new covenant. Um, the will of Jesus is now active and enforced. So once a sacrifice was made, there then was a change. We then became co-heirs and brothers and sisters. Now, didn't Jesus say that when, to Mary Magdalene, I'm going to my God and your God, to my Father and your Father? You know, so he already established that relationship by his body, by his soul, and by his spirit, where then became free. So, with this being said, reread the Last Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-32. I will read that, time permitting. 
All right, so Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 32, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, and a lot of people tend not to read this, um, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in doing so, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number are asleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. So, Paul stated this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 32. And I'm going to state this myself, is that many just take the bread and drink. And that's just it. You know, that's all that they do. In verse 27, taking communion in an unworthy manner is what the problem is. Now, looking back on the verses, if you read before that, um, people went... The, the, the church had divisions, number one. Number two, people went to eat before others. There was no uh, waiting for others. People were self-centered and selfish. Um, to do so, uh, and then people became drunk. So with all this together, you bring it to today, you know, you know what issues today when people go to take communion? You know, what issues are they dealing with? Unforgiveness or whatever. So, to do so makes someone unworthy of participating in communion because they're, you know, treating it as such a, a, a less and common thing. And you can't do that with the, the, this very act that is sacred. It's in, whenever I do communion, I believe we must examine ourselves because it is a sacred act. We must, in this time, remember Jesus' sacrifice. We must be grateful for what he's done. And we must forgive and forgive others. And that's what I do when I take communion with my family or whoever. I say, that I read that verses, you know, 23 to 32. I say, okay, if we have any unforgiveness, let us work it out according to Matthew chapter 18 with our brothers. So that we will not have nothing against us when we're taking communion. So... Before you take communion, get rid of any hate. Um, go elsewhere with your brother or your sister and work anything out that you may have against each other. Then, you know, after you do so, ask God, Lord, is there anything in my heart against anyone? And if there is, then God will reveal it to you. So make sure you do this before you take communion. Because Paul stated that in scripture, that there, that is why many of you are weak and sick. And some of you have died. Because they, they have taken communion in such an unworthy manner. So, I pray that, you know, this video has blessed you. Um, I pray that maybe it has opened your eyes to the old covenants and what Jesus had did. And in this new covenant, how he has set us free. So, you know, thank you for taking the time to watch. And bless you.